Hello everybody, I hope all of you are doing great. I am very excited about today's video because today's video we are going to be talking about Emacs Lisp. Emacs Lisp is one of my favorite things, I talk about it a lot on this channel, and it's one of the main things that makes Emacs so lovable and makes it so extensible. And so in this video I'm going to be doing everything I can to teach you guys the basics and well advanced features of Emacs Lisp. I can't teach you everything in one video, but I will be giving you theoretically everything you need in order to understand the majority of Emacs Lisp code and write your own Emacs Lisp code and extend Emacs. Now there are some advanced features and packages I would have loved to cover in this video, but just to the time constraints, I wasn't able to cover them. Make sure to check out one of my videos on the more obscure features of Emacs, which I say are obscure, but actually just features that people usually misunderstand, which I'll be sure to have right up here, as well as my video on seal loop, common lisps loop macro. Um, which I'll be talking about in this video. Both of those videos are very useful and you'll probably really enjoy them if you enjoy this video. Now I'm going to try and do some follow-up videos on some of the more advanced Emacs Lisp features. So if you guys are interested in that, make sure to subscribe and tick the bell, you know, all that stuff that everybody else says. Um, and be sure to let me know down in the comments what packages and Emacs Lisp features you'd like to see in the future. Um, that's really important for me as well as people watching this. I want to make this an opportunity for everybody to learn and not just me spilling, talking about Emacs list features that maybe everybody knows and not talking about the ones that everybody would like to know. Now, before we get too far into the video, I wanted to give a big shout out to today's sponsor, Brilliant. What is Brilliant, you're probably wondering? Well, Brilliant is an interactive learning platform focused on giving you real life examples and awesome opportunities to learn more about the world. One of Brilliant's greatest strengths is giving you hand-on experience with different topics. Getting hands-on experience with Brilliant can be really helpful if you're learning a brand new topic. For example, in this video we cover Emacs Lisp. If you're brand new to programming, Emacs Lisp might be a bit confusing, and so I recommend taking a look at the Computer Science Fundamentals course from Brilliant. Brilliant's courses cover multiple fields in math, science, and computer science. With Brilliant's focus on having you be an active participant in the learning, I find that I'm able to learn a lot better and retain a lot more of the information than when I was just watching YouTube videos or listening to a university lecture. To get everything Brilliant has to offer now for free for a full 30 days, be sure to check out brilliant.org slash Gavin Freeborn. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's premium annual subscription. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Now let's get into the video and dig into Emacs Lisp. All right, so let's dig into the video. So just for performance reasons, I won't be showing my face for this screencast. Um, unfortunately, OBS seems to be having some performance issues right now. So if I share my screen for more than like five minutes, it starts to go crazy and crash my recording, which definitely sucks. So we will not be doing that for this video. So first up, let's go over some quick Emacs terminology. So the first thing you're going to want to know is all about the things displayed on screen. I have a little breakdown right here for those of you that would like to read it. Feel free to pause, but I'm going to go ahead and jump over to a quick little breakdown right here. The breakdown is basically we have windows, which are basically separated by splits, as you can see here. We have the frame, which is basically the entire Emacs window. If I go back to this guy, you'll see this entire screen, even with all the splits, is still just one frame. So it's basically a window in your operating system. You can kind of think of it that way. So these are all windows. You have the mini buffer, which is the text area at the bottom of Emacs. As you can see, if I go back to Emacs again, you'll see right down here, this is the mini buffer. You actually can Alt X to kind of interact with it. And we use it a bunch in Emacs for a bunch of different things. So this is the mini buffer. These are windows and the frame is everything containing all of that. Next, we have the point, which is basically the cursor. And in addition to the point, we actually have two other things, which really quickly, I'm just going to demo. So in addition to that, we have the mark right here and the region. So a mark is basically wherever the highlighting of something starts. So you can as I say, you can place the mark by hitting control space. And then when you move around, you'll see that you're highlighting some text. So the mark is considered to be um, down here. All right, so I can place the mark here, move around. Uh, pretty straightforward. Then we have the region, which is that highlighted area. And when we hit control W, kill region, that will delete that region and we can paste it with control Y. Pretty straightforward. If the whole mark thing kind of confused you, don't worry about it. I just kind of wanted to explain this because I think this is a point of confusion for a lot of new programmers. And then the other two things are a major mode and a minor mode. So a major mode is basically the current programming language. So right now the major mode in my editor that I'm using right now is org mode. All right, and so when I hit MX, I can set it by hitting enter, set that to org mode. 
changes the major mode. If I set it to C, it would treat this file as if it was a C file. So if I said C mode, it would change this to thinking the programming language was C. Minor modes are kind of like features. So for example, spell checking. And there's a bunch of different minor modes that you'll see throughout Emacs. And so that's basically what they're referring to. Major mode is basically your programming language. Minor mode is like a feature you can toggle on and off. So for example, if I do fly spell mode, that's a minor mode that enables spell checking. And then I can turn it off just as you can see right down here. And so you can have multiple minor modes going at a time, but you can only have one major mode at a time. All right, now that we are through all the boring stuff, let's get into the actual programming in Emacs Lisp. So functions are probably the first thing you'll want to know in Emacs Lisp. Uh, to call a function, you basically put a parentheses at the start, the name of the function, and then its arguments. So if you're used to a lot of other languages, you probably would be more used to this looking similar to this. So this is kind of the equivalent in most other languages like Python. Lisp just does things a little bit differently and it has its pros and its cons, but there's more pros to writing code this way than there are cons in my opinion. Anyways, so if we were to look at this code, we'd see that we're defining a function. So defun means we're defining a function. Its name is my add function. It takes an argument of num and then it simply adds one to the argument we give it. And so we could have multiple arguments. We could have num two, num three, etc. And then if we went ahead and evaluated this code, we would get two because we defined the function and we called it right down here with a argument of one. Now, alternatively, uh, you can use the function fun call right here. Um, it basically does the same sort of thing. We don't even need this. And we can go ahead and call the function like so. Now, I'm going to try and not like overcomplicate things like I did right here. But I basically go into this a lot more in my video. Learn Emacs Lisp, mostly the strange parts. I recommend watching this video. And it kind of explains what's going on here. The idea is that functions and variables don't share the same namespace. So you can have a function named list and a variable named list. And they won't conflict with each other, which is useful, but very confusing for people coming from a lot of other languages where they share the same namespace like JavaScript. If that confused you at all, just make sure you understand this and you're golden. Now let's get into the basic types of Emacs. So I'm going to be evaluating all of these with control X, control E. So we have numbers. If I go ahead and evaluate this, we get one, we have strings. And if I evaluate this, you'll see I get hello and I get hello again when I evaluate this symbol. We'll dig into that in just a second. And we have keywords, which as you can see, evaluate just as you'd expect. And we have characters, which as you can see down here, when we evaluate them, they actually just turn into numbers because really this is just a quick little shorthand for numbers because it's much easier to understand characters written this way than as a integer. Now we have true, which is represented by T, but we'll talk a bit more about this later. False is represented by nil. And then we have pairs or also known as con cells. And so when we evaluate this, we'll see that we get a pair of one and two. And then we have lists, which right here, as you can see, when we evaluate that, we get one, two, three. Now let's get into what quote is. So when I see right here in the symbol section. I used this little quote symbol before hello. And this basically says, do not evaluate the following expression. So we do the same thing here where we quote this expression of plus one and two. So if we were to evaluate this normally without the quote, you'd see that we get three. But if we evaluate it with the quote, you'll see that we get a list of one, two, or sorry, a list of plus one and two. As you can see above, we used quote to create a symbol, which basically means do not evaluate this text right here. Do not evaluate this expression. If we evaluate this, we get the symbol, I am a symbol. Uh, for example, if you evaluated a list of one and two, you would see that we get one, two. Now, as we said before, if we quote something, we can say not to evaluate it. So we can cut out that list part right there. And if we evaluate this, you'll see that we get a list of one and two. Exact same as if this was using the function list. We can do the same thing with con cells. So with con cells, if we evaluate this, you'll see we get one and two, a pair of one and two. And we can do the same thing here where we can create a pair of one and two um, just using quote. Uh, and as I say here, just note that this is just a way that Emacs Lisp represents a pair rather than a list. We put a dot in the center just to kind of distinguish the two. Now we're almost through the more confusing parts of Emacs Lisp. Quoting is probably the most confusing part for people coming from other languages, but it is extremely powerful. Quoting is where the idea of um, code is data. If you've ever heard people talking about Lisp, this is where code is data comes from, is from quoting. And if you guys have ever worked with uh, powerful macro languages in other programming languages, then you might be familiar with a lot of these concepts. In addition to regular quote in Emacs Lisp, we also have quasi quote. Quasi quote allows us to unquote an expression. Now, what does that mean? Well, quasi quote is indicated by a backtick as seen here. And if we were to evaluate this, you'll see that we get a list of one, two, and three. 
And the way that that works is as we used this comma here, comma means to unquote. You can kind of remember that as being like the reverse sort of shape as a normal quote. So we unquote and then we add one and two to get three. So that's kind of where this result is coming from. Now note that we are using backtick, like I mentioned before, instead of the regular quote or single quote. And we use the comma to mean unquote. Now, while that might have been a bit boring for some of you guys that felt you were just sitting around, let's go ahead and dig in some quick examples. Often in Emacs, you use Alt X to access some commands, and these commands are simply functions. Org mode, keycast mode, a bunch of these are all functions. So we can actually create our own interactive function. So in order to do so, you need the expression interactive to be inside of your function in order to tell Emacs that this is a command that we want to expose to the users. So here we are defining a function called insert numbers, and here's our little description of it. And then we need to have the interactive expression right here. And then it says insert one, two, and three. Now, if I was to evaluate this code, you'll see that it just returns the function. But now if I do Alt X and I do insert number, you'll see insert numbers is now a function that I can execute. So if I hit enter, it will insert one, two, and three. And so this is how you can create your own interactive functions. There's a bunch of different use cases that you guys can have. You can also use message if you want to kind of just print something in the mini buffer. So if we were to do this again, see that instead we get one, two, three, rather than inserting it into the buffer. Now I'm sure a lot of you guys can already see really useful ways to apply this. So I won't really dig into this too much more. We're going to go ahead and continue on. In order to learn more about interactive functions, often you want to access them via a key binding, which we'll talk about in just a second down here. In addition, you probably want to look at the documentation for different things. So we can actually look at the documentation by calling alt x describe function and then insert numbers. And you will see that we get numbers is an interactive Emacs list function, yada, 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 inserts a sequence of numbers. And that is coming from this doc string right here. Now Emacs Lisp makes heavy use of these doc strings to document different functions. So for example, let's look at the plus function. Here we'll see that it says that this is a built-in function in some C code. Here's the different arguments it takes, returns a sum of any number of arguments, yada, yada, yada. A lot more information than we got with ours because the doc strings are a lot more useful in this case. Now on to key bindings, probably the most requested thing that people want to do with these interactive functions. And so the most common way to do that is using global set key. Now this will define it no matter the major mode, aka the programming language you are working in. And the way it works is you say global set key is the function. You pass it a function calling kbd, which basically converts this string right here into a key sequence, which is a little confusing for people that aren't familiar with it, but you don't really need to worry about that. Just kind of remember that you use kbd when using this. And then the name of the function as a symbol, right? And so if we went ahead and evaluated this, we can now use control shift and S and it will call our function. We go back and change this to insert like we had the first time. Then we can go ahead and use this control shift S and we get one, two, three. So kind of like what we were expecting before, uh, this is super useful. Now in the more recent versions of Emacs, we don't really need to use KVD. If we're using a new version of Emacs, you can instead use key map global set. And this is kind of like a shorter version of this. And if we hit control shift S, we get the same result. This is just kind of like the new API that Emacs is using. Now I'm gonna go ahead and stick to the functions prefixed with key map, mostly just because they're easier to find. So if I do a control H F key map global set, you can learn a bunch of different things about them. You can also find set, unset, look up a bunch of different things and that can be really useful. Now, sometimes you don't really want to use a key binding across all different programming languages. Sometimes you want something specific. So here's a really simple example of creating a quick way to insert an if statement in C programs. So when I'm writing a C program, I can add a little if statement nice and easily. So here we define a function which will insert an if statement and then we use key map set and then the major mode dash map just means like the key map that we're affecting. So we're affecting the key map when we're working with C files and we're setting control shift L to call our function insert if right here. But when I evaluate that and I open a C file, so here's a C file. If I did if it would do something, but I could do control shift L and it will insert an if statement for me. So this is super useful when you guys are working with different 
key maps for different modes, it can be very helpful. You don't really want to, you know, you're not going to use a C if statement in common list files or in Emacs list or in a bunch of other languages. So here's a really easy way to kind of set it for a specific mode. Now here I kind of break this down. The whole map thing is basically a way to say that this is specific to a mode. So you'll often see this dash map here and key map is just a variable. So if I do control H V and I do dash map, you will see that there's a markdown mode map, a shell mode map, help map, and you'll see that there's a C dash mode map. And when we look at it, unfortunately, it's not the easiest thing to read because it has those same key sequences from before, which is kind of unfortunate. There's different packages to kind of make this a bit more usable. Hit the key that you're using. So you could do control shift L like we had before. And so in this case, it's going to just say the window settings, but we could do that control shift S that we were doing before. So control H K control shift S, and this will give us information about what control shift S runs. It runs the command insert numbers, Found in the global key map and it is an interactive list function yada same sort of stuff we saw in the other help page that we were looking at now since all functions share a single namespace this means that we had to come up with a clever way for emacs packages to prevent conflicts and so this is often done by using a little prefix at the start so you'll find that a lot of functions start with something like org dash or org dash dash for a function so for example if i do hf org new line You'll see that we have a function here. Now you'll see that there is a just normal dash without two dashes and then one with two dashes. So the two dashes is a way to generally indicate that this is private and a single dash indicates that it is public as shown here. Uh, so this means that this is meant for the user to be used and this means that this function is meant to be used internally by the org mode package. All right, now let's dig into conditionals. So we have if statements, which is probably the most common one that people are used to. So we have if this is true, then return it was true. If it is false, then return it was false. Now, as we mentioned before, D is treated as true. And as we mentioned before, nil is treated as false. Now, note that even though I was saying T means true, it's basically anything other than nil is considered true. So for example, here where I say this is true and this was true, you'll see that it returns this was true because basically anything that is non-nil, so if we change this to nil, you'll see that it returns this was false. Anything, even like a one here, will be treated as true. Now we also have when and unless. Since if expressions can be a little bit difficult to read at first glance, as you can see right here, people often use uh, when if the only situation you want to handle is true. So here, if it's true, then we will run this code. And if it is nil, then we will just return nil. Same thing here. Unless is basically the same thing as saying when not. So if we run that code, you'll see this is false. And same thing here. This is false. This is kind of like the opposite of using when. This is just useful when you don't really need to handle both the true or false case. And just like in basically every other language, we have the whole concept of and, as you can see here, and or as well. So if it's true or false, uh, then it will return true. And if it is not true, then it will return nil. And if it is not nil, then it will return true. Basic stuff that you would kind of expect to see in any other language. Now in Emacs Lisp, the last expression evaluated is treated as the return statement, which can be useful, but can also be an issue if you're working with if expressions. The big reason for this is that if we wanted to do, say, run the code message and then return this was true, we need to use a thing called progin. Now progin will execute each of these things in a row, so you'll see if we go down to our messages, which is everything printed in the mini buffer, you will see print this to the mini buffer and this was true. So we'll do each of these things in sequence. And this is really useful in the case like this, where you just need to sequence different things, different operations in a row, rather than just returning a single expression. If I was to try and evaluate this, you would see that we only run the message versus with the prog n, we will execute all of it in a row. So you'll see that we still return this was true. And as I mentioned here, this is a big reason people use when and unless. It's just to kind of avoid having to use prog n because it can be a little ugly. In addition, a lot of people also will use cond, um, which I won't be covering in this video, but you guys can go ahead and look it up doing control H F cond and you get a little breakdown of how it works. Now let's dig into variables. So Emacs often has things configured via variables. As we mentioned before, C dash mode map is simply just a variable and a ton of different things are variables. So for example, if we wanted to change something related to markdown, you'd see that everything is basically configured via variables and it's all prefixed with markdown as you'd expect from what we mentioned before. 
And so we could go ahead and modify these as we like, since they're all just variables. Now, how can we find out about them? Doing control H V gives us a list of all the variables, or we can use describe variable. Now, how can we set these variables? Well, we can use set Q. So we can set Q. Let's change the markdown hide URLs variable. So if we change this to true, then this will take effect right away. If we do control H V mark down hide URLs, you'll see that now this is set to true. If we open this up, you'll see its value is true. Its original value was nil. It is local to the buffer, yada, yada, yada. Uh, so a bunch of different stuff. Now, in addition to set queue, uh, newer versions of Emacs have set opt. Set opt is a lot more useful because it offers things like type checking. Now, instead, we can use the markdown command. This is kind of what markdown mode will use for previewing. So if we evaluated this, it will work as expected. But if we change this to a one, and evaluated this, we would get a warning that it does not match the type used for this function. Now, if we go ahead and go to the definition uh, for this guy, so if we go ahead and do control HV and go to the definition right here, see it's defined with def custom, which is where the type description comes from. And so def custom is kind of a really helpful thing. If you use set opt this way, it also in some cases will use like a setter function, which will make sure that it's applied right away rather than having some weird conflicting state, which you can have if you guys are familiar with like NeoVim or Vim, a lot of the times that'll happen if you set a variable and you don't reload the package. Now, in addition to being able to set the variable, sometimes you want to define a new variable using def var. The format is very simple. It's just def var, the name of the variable, its setting, and then a description of it. And so if I was to go ahead and evaluate this and then do control hv thing, we can see the doc string ends up here and its value is one. We're going to dig a bit into lists. This is probably one of the big things in common lisp and emacs lisp and basically any lisp you look at that you need to know about. So lisps are just basically a collection of con cells. Recall the type cons. So if we evaluate that, you'll see that we get a pair of one and two. A pair in most languages is basically what a con cell is. Now a list is basically a const construct or a list of con cells. So when we chain them and terminate them with nil as seen here and evaluate that, you'll see that we get a list of one and two. This is basically all a list is, is just chaining con cells that ends with nil, right? So if you guys are familiar with the concept of a linked list, this is basically all a list in Emacs Lisp is, and this is basically a common trait shared with every single Lisp. Um, so if you can understand this, then you pretty much understand how lists work in almost every other language. Uh, and nil is basically a shorthand for an empty list and also used as false. So it's kind of an overloaded language feature, but it's also quite helpful because it's probably one of the very few things you need to really remember because it's used for a lot of different things. All right, we made it through some of the more confusing stuff and variables. Um, so now let's go ahead and go into iteration. So a lot of these you guys can learn about using describe function or control HF, but we're going to kind of go through each of these one at a time very quickly. So common lisp loop is a very simple iteration system uh, that requires you to import a library that comes with Emacs, but it is probably the most familiar to those of you coming from other languages. So here we basically make a simple loop going for, so we make a for loop using I as the variable from zero to 10. And then we just basically collect i times i. So if I hit control C, control C to evaluate this, you'll see that we get a list going from zero to 10 times in itself. So if you know 10 times 10 equals 1,000, and zero times zero equals zero, one times one equals one, two times two equals four, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is basically probably the most simple iteration system and then the next one is a while loop. This is probably also quite familiar to a lot of you guys. Now we're going to set some little variables right here. So we're going to set a variable called my val, my truth, and we're going to say while my truth is true, do all this stuff, and then we will be setting it here. So we're going to go if my value equals 10, then set my truth to nil. So we will be iterating until my val equals 10. So if I evaluate this and we look at our messages, this should be printing out each of the individual steps. So as you can see right here, our while loop basically increments from one all the way up to 11, and then when we get to 11, we'll see that it is kind of like what we'd expect. We equaled 10. This is set to true. And then we add one more time. I hope that makes sense to all of you guys. Uh, while loops are pretty self-explanatory. Probably didn't explain them the best, but I'm sure a lot of you are pretty familiar with it. Another one that you'll see a lot is uh, do times. So do times is basically a way to say like a normal for loop if you guys are used to C. So we iterate from zero to three and we're setting that value in I. We have our total set to nil and we'll just be consing it the whole way. And as you can see right here, 
we create basically a list iterating from one all the way until i is less than three, which is two. And then finally, we have do list, which is pretty useful. You'll use this quite a bit in your configs. If you decide to use it, sometimes you'll use a multitude of other ways to iterate through a list, but this will basically iterate through a list and it's useful for doing operations like printing things or something like that or setting a value a lot of times. So here we iterate through a list of one, two, and three. We add them together into a total and we total up to six as you'd expect because one plus two plus three equals six. If you guys are familiar with functional programming, there's map, filter, and reduce in Emacs Lisp. I won't be covering that in this video, but it's very useful if you guys are familiar with functional programming and a bit easier to work with than this code here. Often, if you aren't familiar with functional programming and don't really want to learn it yet, feel free to just stick with common Lisp loop. I have a whole dedicated video on it that I recommend taking a look at. Uh, it should get you started with learning the more complex features of it. And now we are on to hooks. So what is a hook? Well, a hook to a newcomer might seem a little confusing, but the concept is quite simple. It's basically just a list of functions that are ran in a particular situation. A good example of this that's often used is when a function is ran, at the very end we want to run a set of functions that the user may customize and set up for themselves, or maybe other packages will take advantage of. Now in this case, the notation is quite similar to what you'll see everywhere else, where you'll see like the name of the function, or maybe the name of the major mode, or maybe the name of a set of files or something, followed by dash hook. If we go control H V, you'll see that if we do dash hook, there are a ton of different hooks that we can take advantage of. Now, if we evaluate this code, you will see that we get a list containing our Lambda from up here. Now, if we run our function by doing my fun, you'll see that it inserts a three because while our code doesn't actually do anything, at the very end, we run our hooks. And since our hooks are just a bunch of different functions to run, it inserts three since that's what this Lambda right here does. Now we can add a, another hook by doing control CC here and evaluating it. And as you can see, we've now made this from being a list of one function to a list of two functions. And if we were to run my fun again, you would see that it inserts four and then three. The power of this is that the user can customize these hooks and different packages can take advantage of these hooks to kind of integrate with other packages and functions much better rather than maybe manipulating the function or doing some other hackery. Now, if you're familiar with Vim, then you're probably familiar with the concept of auto commands. This is quite similar, but I personally find it a bit less finicky. A big use case that this is used in for most uh, configurations is making some settings specific to a particular programming language. So for example, we can set some stuff for whenever we open an Emacs Lisp file, like so. We can add a hook to the Emacs Lisp mode hook. This hook is ran every time we open Emacs Lisp files, and this contains a Lambda, which turns off tabs for indentation. If we evaluate that, you will see our Lambda added to the front of this. And every time we open an Emacs Lisp file, this Lambda will be ran and will turn off indentation using tabs. Now, moving on, we're going to talk about temporary variables. So probably the most common reason to use a temporary variable is if you want something local to a function. Now, this is done using the special form known as let. The concept is very simple. It goes like so. So you call let, and then it's followed by a list of different definitions. So here we define four to equal two plus plus two and five to equal the number five. And then down here, within the let expression, after this list of declarations, we can use these values. So we can say four minus five, and when we evaluate that, we'll see that it is negative one. Now, if we tried to do something outside of the let, say if we wanted to do the same thing, put this outside of our let from above and evaluate that, we would get an error as you can see right down here. Value as variable is void four. So four is void. We don't know what four is. And it probably would say the same thing. And in order to make this work, we have to have this inside of the let expression right here. Hopefully that's pretty easy to follow. It's not useful for everybody, but it will help you understand some of the code that you guys will be reading. And probably when you want to do some more advanced customization, this will be quite helpful. And if you guys want to see more of me talking about Emacs Lisp, I highly recommend the following videos. Learn Emacs Lisp, mostly the strange parts. This will cover a lot of what I talked about in this video, but it'll go a lot more deep, especially explaining some of the more confusing stuff involving kind of the difference between a function and the difference between a variable and kind of how they overlap with each other and how it's different from other languages and a bunch of other confusing things to new programmers in Emacs Lisp. In addition, I have a video on common Lisp's loop. This is basically the same thing as CL-loop that I was showing off earlier, and you can learn a ton about it here. I highly recommend it if you're coming from another language. It's kind of just a bit easier to understand rather than using the other stuff that I showed in this video, unless you're 
you're used to functional programming, then I recommend looking at map, filter, and reduce. Finally, next time I will be talking about dynamic and lexical scoping, macros, and buffer manipulation, probably a bunch more other stuff when I look through the comments, so be sure to let me know what you want me to talk about in the future. Hopefully I can get all of this into one video, but chances are these are going to be split up into at least two videos, and I don't know, maybe we'll find out some other stuff from you guys that might be more useful, or you guys will have a very interesting idea of how to explain this. Feel free to let me know down in the comments how you guys think you would try to explain these. I would love to hear your insight and what I could improve for a future video. And that is it for today, everybody. Thank you so much for sticking through this video. It means a lot to me, and I'm very happy to have such a supportive fan base. And being able to contribute to the Emacs community, it means a lot to me because Emacs is, in my opinion, one of the greatest things known to mankind. Um, but in reality, it actually it means a lot to have you guys sticking around. I wanted to give a big shout out to my supporters on Patreon and GitHub sponsors. You guys have been doing the Lord's work for me. You guys have made this a lot easier for me to be able to support myself and be able to actually rationalize putting time into this rather than working on the side um, just to be able to afford like rent and everything these days. It's really helped a lot. And I'm trying to put some of that money back into the channel myself uh, whenever I can. Now be sure to check out those videos that I mentioned before to get a better handle on Emacs Lisp. If you guys have recommendations or feedback or anything, be sure to throw it down in the comments below. It really means a lot. And thank you all. I'll see you next time.